one gig and uh, often you get the red light when you're doing a gig and they say, by the way, when you've got two minutes left, you get the red light. And I walked on stage and the red light was on. <laughs> and it was very weird to be like, oh, well, you've clearly taken against me. My zero words was quite enough. Uh, for you, and uh, either way, I went afterwards and I said, yeah, guys, I, was, I did feel slightly undermined uh, by the instant red light, and they said, there's no red light, that one's green. And I discovered I was colorblind, uh, which is probably a better way to do it than when I eventually take my driving tests. Uh, but uh, no, his name is Jonathan Chippendale. He works for a company called Holition. He is a augmented reality guru. So please, go wild and crazy. Come on, guys. For Jonathan Chippendale. Oh, God. Well done. Thank you. So we're just, obviously it's a tech startup, so we're having some technical startup issues with my presentation. But we are now logged in, and I'm hoping Oh, it's gone, anyway. Um, uh, Sansa, thank you very much indeed um, for not mentioning that we actually met 10 minutes ago in the gents' toilets for the first time. I, I'm, I'm grateful that you kept that one quiet. Um, thank you for bringing up the Chippendale reference. Um, I think that's another startup um, that's uh, not augmented reality. Uh, hopefully that's the real thing. Um, just while the technical stuff's kind of going on, um, I guess because of the nature of the audience, it might be interesting just to, to understand a little bit of the journey about who we are, what we do. Um, particularly bear in mind that we seem to have some screen resolution problems. Um, Helition is, um, I guess, uh, sort of almost a startup followed by a startup. We, we are either five years old or three years old, depending on your point of view. Um, we are a group of um, ex-marketing and retail directors from luxury. So that's the kind of space that we, we used to play in. And we were really interested and actually quite frustrated by the limited uh, number of marketing tools that we had at our disposal when we were doing our day jobs. Um, fantastic PR, great print advertising, but it was all really about the store. You had to be able to appreciate the weight of the Rolex watch, the stitcher in the Birkin bag, and digital was just seen to be, this is five years ago, digital was seen to be way too impersonal uh, a channel to, to talk about these really important issues like service and, and, and quality and style and uh, craftsmanship and, and, and actually a very sort of impersonal channel to talk about smell and sense and, and taste and, and all of these really important things that the luxury held, held true. Um, yet at the same time, and I guess five years ago, um, you know, this was all very new, but uh, you know, we were aware of this amazing divergence be between the way that luxury was marketing and, and the type of um, consumers who were becoming more and more digital. So really, we were just interested in seeing whether we could find a technology or a series of technologies that almost plugged that gap between luxury and diverging consumers. And to do that, we had to come up with technology that was um, up to the quality of the client base that we were pitching into. Um, but we also had to tell consumers that actually luxury did have a message for them, and premium retail did have a message for them. And, and I guess Helician's a journey. I mean, um, uh, yeah, we, we're just sort of exploring what, what luxury can do in a digital world, and we're exploring um, you know, what technology can do to kind of fill that gap. And we are very, very technology agnostic, and I feel very... Um, I feel slightly embarrassed um, uh, coming to a, a, a little tech seminar and talking about this because even though we are a technology firm, we build everything in-house, we develop everything, we patent, we do all of that kind of stuff, we're actually apologetic because you know, I don't need to know, or, my, or, or luxury and their customers don't need to know how an iPad works, the wiring, all the good stuff that goes into it. You know, I, I just need an iPad to read emails and look at my calendar, my daughter wants to play Angry Birds, you know, that's what it's all about. So what we try and do is push much sort of stronger on, on strategy, so how does technology fit the needs of our client base? Creativity, I, how can we uh, extrapolate that strategy and deliver it to the most interesting possible way? And then, yeah, let's have a look at the technology and find out the right type of technology that will um, deliver that interesting idea to the end consumer. And it's a, a notion that we sort of rather randomly called the future store. And, and what it means is we're, we're really interested in exploring um, how technology can support you know, omni-channel, this, this wonderful phrase that everybody's using at the moment, but a very, very accurate and apt one. So we do technology that works online. We're very interested in taking that, that technology in store and sort of creating this theatre sort of thing that, that, that people are interested in. Um, in uh, deploying, and then we're also very interested in the role of mobile and how that flitters between the sort of two of them. And I guess um, over the next 20 minutes, I'll, I'll show you some of this um, and some of the brands that I can talk about. 
Um, I'll show you one or two brands that I can't really talk about, but I'll let you know uh, for all you tweeters if you could not use brand names. And then there's some other stuff that I, I can't talk about unless, unless I've got a drink in my hand. So I'm just going to give you a kind of rundown of some of the projects. So this is Tiso. This was the very, very first project we did three years ago. It's augmented reality. Uh, Shannon is just raising his arm. He's putting it in front of his webcam. A watch glues itself onto his wrist. He can move his hand around, turn it around, view it. It's as if he's actually wearing it. And then down the left-hand side here, you can see a number of different watches. In fact, in this application, there were 36 different SKUs. You can click very, very quickly and see all of those watches. And then because of this one here, it's uh, the T-Touch. The T-Touch has different functions. It's a diving watch. It's an altimeter. It even tells the time. You can touch the watch with your mouse, your, your virtual watch, and see video content that gives it an educational element as well. So that was three years ago. Um, that was three years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry, my clickers um, decided to freeze. Mr. Tech person. Ah, OK, cool. So um, <laughs> moving on. Um, so we've done a lot of these types of projects. This is for uh, a brand called De Beers. Um, this was in Asia, and they use this technology to launch uh, their new jewelry collections into uh, North America as well. Um, go forward. Um, this here is Boucheron, which is, which I mean, I love this project because some of the arrows that were chucked at us in our sort of early days were um, from luxury brands saying, but I'm about creativity and craftsmanship and history and provenance and, you know, digital's not really for me. Uh, I mean, uh, this is one of the oldest jewelry brands in the world. They're 180 years old. They are classically, wonderfully, arrogantly French. And, um, you know, we did this application for them. And you won't kind of see there, but this is actually in Place Vendôme, which is the heartland of all of that wonderful Gallic arrogance. And, and to do something digital in the middle of that space was a really, really brave thing for them to do. So that's Boucheron having a sort of bit of fun in Place Vendôme. Wow, fun in luxury. Who would have guessed it? Um, and we've done lots of these deployments now into various department stores. That Tiso application I've seen, we've put it into windows so that people can try and watch it in the street. We did it with Selfridges over a two-week period in May three years ago. Sales of watches went up 83%. Um, uh, we're starting to do more and more work on mobile. Um, this is one of those brands I can't talk about, but it's a pop-up shop where you can, I think you can guess from the, from the handbag who it, who it may or may not be. Um, <laughs> and so we can start taking retail out of stores and taking it into other areas where, where consumers <coughs> congregate. Fair few amount of retail tie-ups with uh, media companies. There's a project we did with Vogue around the royal wedding um, when um, uh, uh, she married that other chap. And uh, you can put your face in front of a mirror, a tiara comes onto your head, and you too can be a princess for a day. Hey. Um, it was quite fun. Um, autostereoscopic 3D, which I said I'm not technical, I'm not, but I'm told. Um, it's um, 3D where you don't require glasses to see the effect. This was a window we did for De Beers. This is Isatan department store in Japan. We've done a similar one for this brand in Fifth Avenue and in Bond Street. Um, those people are kind of seeing a, a, a sort of large, a really beautiful film, but it's kind of happening outside the window. It stops, it engages them, it's very disruptive. You know, once, you're, once they're held, can you get them into the store? This is a holographic project. The largest one ever done in the world is for a brand called Dunhill. It was in Shanghai last year. Um, 64 real models with holographic content projected into it, so it looks like they're in a snow globe and other stuff going on as well. We uploaded a film of this, um, and we uploaded it three hours after the event finished. And within one week, three and a half million people around the world had seen it. Um, starting to do clothing, this is a project we did um, for uh, Ogilvy and Selfridges. Um, it's almost like a virtual mirror um, so that uh, uh, you two can wear the underwear that Helena Christensen is wearing. It was a very successful and award-winning, too, for Ogilvy. Um, we often look at internships. Um, because I come from luxury, and our clients are luxury, and there's no disrespect to luxury, um, they're not the brands that are going to innovate in this area. So you have to find the innovation somewhere else. They're so risk-averse. Just getting them to adopt technology like, like this, you need a, an Archimedes lever that's, that's pretty long. So um, we often work with students, and we just say, look, here are the tools that we have. You know, this may be how Dunhill's done it, but how would you do it? And we just try and kind of get this whole sort of creative mix going. Creativity is very, very important for us. So before we look at um, some of the things that are in the studio today, I just want to very quickly talk about mobile, which everybody's mad about and everybody loves. Me too. Um, and I'm just trying to remember sort of two or three years ago when 
mobile really wasn't considered to be a, a sort of viable channel at all. And I guess at the heart of it, and I'm talking about luxury now, which is the area that I know about a little, um, I'm just very, very sort of interested in, in the way that, um, that sort of networks have allowed um, brands to change the way that they talk to the end consumer. So when I think about a brand, and let's call it Gucci, and I'm being very unfair because all the brands are the same, but hey, Gucci's there, so let's just use them as an example. Gucci 10 years ago go, told you what to wear. They told you how to wear it. There was a picture of Kate Moss wearing incredible clothes. You know, it, was, it was very standoffish, uh, standoffish, and they controlled all the shots. They controlled the communication. And through mobile and through networks and online and digital, that has completely changed or, or is changing rapidly. And now, actually, the, the, sort of the idea that a brand will try and dictate your life in the rigid way that it used to seems nonsensical and amazing. And in fact, Kate Moss may well be a role model, but an equally important role model to you could be your best friend, who's cooler than you and dresses better than you, and actually, I want to look like them. And actually, what they're not doing is dress head to tail in Burberry check, like Joan Collins used to do in the 70s, getting out of a private jet, looking like a Burberry check sort of ad. Now, that just looks like it's stupid and ill-informed and rather dumb. Actually, it's all about mixing everything up and, and, and getting your inspiration from lots of different places. And, and networks really do that well. So just the, the sort of extent of this is extraordinary. So I'm going to just give you a few figures on um, UK mobile take-up. Um, not last Christmas, but the one before. The numbers from this Christmas are just coming out. But if I look at um, uh, just the UK, in December, there were 6.8 million activations of iPads, Androids, tablets, smartphones. And that's basically one in 10 of the entire population got one of those devices, not last Christmas, but the one before. And that was based on a, on a then penetration of around 14%. So there's a huge amount of these tablets around. And the impact of that is, again, extraordinary. So high street retail sales around Christmas went up 2 to 3%, but M-commerce sales went up 275%. And you probably say, well, look, they should have gone up by 500%, 600%. The base is so low. But if you look at site um, traffic, and spend into the top 150 UK retail sites, 20% of all traffic and 15% of all spend came from M-commerce. Taking it back into my world of luxury, one of our clients, um, you know, three or four years ago, we were talking about innovative technology, and they were like, well, I don't believe in e-commerce. No one's ever going to buy one of my products online. And then a year later, we went back to him, and he said, I've now got a, an amazing website. I've taken your advice. We've got a great website. It's full of flash. No one can look at it on a mobile device. And I'm just really interested in this notion that 10 years ago, he was telling you how to do it, but now consumers are one step ahead of these major brands. And that's a really interesting idea. OK, I'm going to just show you some stuff that we've got in the lab now before lunch, just to get your appetite going or, or to completely dis destroy it. Um, we do a lot of work in augmented reality. It's one of about five different technologies that we practice in. Um, and in the retail sense, because we are a, a specialist within the retail, I'll just show you two or three of these. So this is one about cosmetics. Um, not a massive fan of cosmetics, or, or certainly not since my university days. So I, I am told that actually if you walk into Selfridges, for example, um, it is difficult to try on large numbers of lipstick. Um, so can augmented reality help? So <clears throat> We're retail, a lot of our clients are, are female or have female-friendly product. So I try and employ uh, female developers if, if possible. Tech is a very male world. Um, we need more women in there sort of um, de developing some of these products. So this is Sandrine, uh, she's French. Um, she's developed this lipstick trial and app application. There's no hardware here other than a Mac, but we're now doing this on mobile, we can do it in store, and we've got a big project coming down the line for a very well-known brand. So, you know, can augmented reality help the purchase process? I think with something along these lines, you probably can. Um, this is a project we did for a, another jewelry brand. Um, this went into Bloomingdale's. The Corey is a, a very large American for bridal ring organization. And there's the augmented reality ring. She's not wearing anything. She's just putting her hand up in front of her mobile, and she's got a ring there. There are 25 rings along the bottom, so you can choose your ring. And because we're a marketing firm, and we always like to push the technology for our clients with a marketing sort of edge. Um, we did some great um, uh, virtual weddings on ABC News in the morning in New York out, outside Bloomingdale's where a guy's getting engaged, he proposes, he's not got the ring. Uh, hey, put your hand in front of that mirror. That's the one I want. And because it's PR, somebody runs out with the ring and it's a beautiful moment live on ABC News. Um, and then just a couple of projects, but please, please, if you 
if you feel you are able to not tweet the name, I'd be very, very grateful. And if you uh, want to ask me why, I'll be through there at, at, at lunch, particularly for in government. I want to talk to me from government about this. So Vans, um, we've just, this went in two weeks ago. It's in um, Los Angeles. Um, it's a, a sort of virtual mirror, and you can try on anything up to 200 different pairs of shoes. Um, here are some customers trying on pairs of shoes. We, we take a screen grab of, of customers within a sealed network for um, privacy details just to see how the shoes are doing and you know, how the tracking kind of working on. And I guess here are, here are them. And it's just a really, fun, um, it's a really fun project because we're getting these pictures and we're seeing customers laugh. And we're seeing them enjoy themselves. And we're seeing them trying to try on products and dragging in their mums and having a look at things. And, and again, I, I just think engagement's you know, half of the battle. If you can do that in a retail space, you know, why can't you have fun in retail? So this is another one I'd be very grateful if you didn't mention, <laughs> mention too much. But here's a proof of concept. It's for Uniqlo. Uniqlo are all about color. Russell, my CTO, is wearing a green t-shirt. But through the application, he can change that t-shirt into whatever color he wants. When we did this, he's still wearing a green t-shirt. When we did this project, this proof of concept, Uniqlo had not decided on their full uh, color range for the autumn last year, because it went into stores in October. Now we know they've got 102 colors, and we've wired it up with 102 colors. And this is Alex, my producer, trying it on, actually in the store in San Francisco. She's wearing a red puffer jacket, but she can change it into whatever color she wants. You'll see there's an iPad on the right, which is driving it from their website. But we did another quite nice little innovation where if she had an iPhone in her pocket, it would start to vibrate. If she pulls it out and thinks, Who's, is that my mother texting me? It's, uh, no, it's a Unicode mirror. Can I talk to your iPhone or iPad? And if you say yes, then you've got it in your hand, and you can change all the colors on your iPhone. You can take photographs and automatically upload it to Facebook, tweet it, send it to friends. Do I look good in this? Do, do I go for the cerise or the? or the mustard yellow. So quite a nice project too, and very successful. Um, and very successful from a social media point of view. So this is um, obviously YouTube. Um, the launch was on the 5th of October. Um, this is the 7th of October, two days later. This is just three American girls in San Francisco taking a film for themselves with their iPhone, and it's got 160,022 views. So uh, there's something interesting about these networks going on. OK, so just. Just to close off with, Jennifer also asked me to just very quickly chat about uh, upcoming sort of trends and where all this is kind of going. And, and I haven't got a clue um, because it's a journey and it's an evolution, not a revolution. But I am very interested in this notion of social multiplication. And, um, and I don't think brands have got it yet, um, not because they don't want to, but because I don't think anyone's really got to grips with how social media and networks can, can generate cash. Um, Topshop's done some quite cool things. Burberry do a lot in social media, but, but to get cash, I don't think anyone's really, really cracked that. But, so the kind of proto stage of that is, is sharing. Now, this is Emma's uh, Gemel Carré. Uh, it could be the uh, Burberry art of a trench. It's getting people to, to <laughs> upload their own photographs of them wearing it. And this stems from a really interesting insight from pierre Alexis Dumas, who's the creative director for Emma's. And he said, this goes back to how luxury is changing the way it talks to its customer base. He said that, when he looks at his shops now and he sees a row of ties or a row of products, he, gets, he finds that really boring. He doesn't think they express the brand. Now, the product in the shop is the brand, but no, not anymore. What he's interested in is what happens when that product walks out of the, the um, shop and what happens to it then. So it, the tie could be worn you know, like a, for a CEO in the board meeting. It could be a big fat knot down here like a footballer. It could be, you know, there's a whole load. It could be a belt. There's a whole load of kind of stories here. And he's interested in the story. So now Hermes is a collection of millions of different personal stories of how those products are used and integrated into their life. So much more of this, it's not generating cash yet, but it's an interesting start. Um, and then other ways of trying to get the... Um, the sort of stuff which is good online, which is data and information and rational stuff and how to bring that in store. This is quite old, so you've probably all seen this, but I do find it interesting because you can like things on the CNA Brazil Facebook and then that score goes straight onto the hanger. Now, I'm quite interested in this because if that hanger said one, which means that no one online likes it, would you want it? You might because you, either you'll say no one likes it, so it's not very good, I'm, I don't want it, or you might say, hey, I know I'm going to stand out in that because everyone else is wearing something else. It's kind of giving you information and allowing you to, to make choices in uh, stores. And just finally, um, 
let's just go completely mad, which is the idea that actually you are retailers. And there's a lot of this starting to happen now. So, you know, why go to a brand? Why not just shop from your amazing best friend who's really cool and really switched on and, and knows what's happening? So there's quite a lot of this, but Nuji you may know of. They've been around for a while. But Nuji works by um, allowing, so I, I want this really cool pair of shorts on the right-hand side there. So I post it on Nuji, and when I post it, um, I get some points. And then when I share it with my network, I get some more points. And then when my network shares it with their network, I get some more points. And the more points I get, the more kind of discount I get. So I can kind of get the product that I want, but I get it cheaper. Now, really basic idea, but some of the figures that are starting to appear behind some of these sites, I think, are staggering. So on Nuji, there are 30,000 brands represented. There are 500,000 products <coughs> on that site. And they're getting 60 million views every couple of months. And that's the kind of figure that a lot of brands would kill their grandmothers to, um, to <laughs> own and to have. I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure they're out there. Um, and it's not done through any marketing. There isn't, they haven't used Kate Moss. They haven't got the amazing store on Bond Street. It's just the power of social media. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, OK. Uh, apparently, no, quite that was the thing. No questions. Ah. Oh, one question. question. Sorry. I'm going to have to take it, though. No, no, no. Jonathan will. No, no, take it, please. <laughs> Who's got the question? <laughs> oh, if the audience wants to ask one question. Okay. It's you. Oh, yeah. uh, great presentation, Jonathan. Can you tell us more about what you see this phrase, social multiplication? What do you see out there? Because I'm very intrigued by that so, phrase. So I guess in the end, in this, in this room, we're all about trying to generate cash. In the end, that's what it's about. Um, otherwise, there's no vicarage, there's no Maserati, as I've been hearing. So. Um, so I'm interested in, in just the power of networks to leverage cash for people. So on the Nuji example, they were also saying that, that they're getting about, sorry, um, people are spending about $3.2 per visit. Now, if you take the 60 million site views and you multiply that by $3.21, that's a lot of value. Now, I don't know who's capturing that. I don't know how much Nuji are getting. I don't know how much the brands are getting. I guess most of it's going back to the brands. But... But there are some interesting figures there. Now, it's all about, I, th I guess, in the end, um, expanding your channels and expanding your consumer base. And if you can expand your consumer base by snowballing, by saying, if I send it to you and you're a like-minded soul and, and actually we can have a chat, you know, there's a very good chance that your friends are too and their friends are too. So if you can use those channels and, and really leverage uh, a financial gain there, then I think it's really powerful. I don't think brands know how to do this yet. I think most of the brands with, you know, including Nuji, that's an experiment. I think most of the brands, you know, I mean, I, I was asked uh, about a month ago to, to friend Toilet Duck on Facebook, you know. Yeah, trying to build these, these networks is, um, is fine, but actually the real conversation is how to leverage them. I don't think anyone's doing it well. Burberry, possibly. Uh, sorry, not Burberry. Uh, uh, Topshop, possibly. Because they've just got this really sort of, I forget what they call, the infinite loop is what they call it. And the infinite loop is about understanding that a purchase can happen at any point. And it can happen in a store, but it can happen online, it can happen in a mobile space, it can happen at any point. It can happen out there now, today. And what they're trying to do is um, uh, uh, create as many opportunities for you to go, I want to buy something on, on Topshop. And they're doing a lot of that in social media. So I think they are, they're, they're, I think they're doing really, really well in that, in that space. But, but how do you make money? You speak very well. <laughs> Thank you. We're looking for funds. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want a Maserati. Oh, I thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. That is awesome. And uh, that was really, really interesting. I like that uh, a lot. Uh, the Jonathan, I don't know whether you realize that this is being live streamed. Okay, phew. I, I was getting really worried when I was like going, please don't tweet this. I was thinking, oh dear Lord. <laughs> don't tweet it. We'll just broadcast it to everyone. Uh, okay, switch off in Seattle. Uh, the, uh, and so uh, now there is lunch. Who's ready for lunch? Yay!
Yay! And then, oh, just before we go, though, we, I thought it'd be quite good, because everyone's want to... By the way, where are the people who are in the startups? Stand up if you've got a startup looking for... Stand up if you're a startup looking for... Hey, look, there we go. They're, they're lovely. Good job to them. And then now sit down, startups. And now, where are the angels who are looking to invest in startups? Look, guys, you've got a busy lunch. I know there's also a man there. Uh, and uh, all right, now that's happened. And there's going to be loads of other interesting people. So uh, that's it. It is lunchtime. Give it up for everyone you saw so far.